Good. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Peter Riddle. I'm director of the Institute for Government, and I'm delighted to be here at this session in the kind of the, the middle day of Civil Service Live in London for a, a question time panel. Um, those of you who used to question time on Thursday may find it slightly different. Um, I'm trying to think who's going to be the populist um, who wins all the applause um, for condemning things that the government are doing, and I haven't quite worked that out. Um, uh, who'll do that? Um, I have my private bet, but I'll, I'll see that. Um, we haven't really got a kind of um, total eccentric uh, figure. Uh, I suppose I fulfill that role. Uh, the, the Johnson Ross, someone like that, Russell Brand uh, figure, who will come at it from a completely different angle. But I don't know about Paul, you know, um, uh, after years of the Olympics might do that. Now, let me introduce first the panel. Um, on my uh, far right, Paul Dighton, who's now Commercial Secretary of the Treasury, joined the, the government after we had a long career at Goldman Sachs and then was involved in the Olympics project extremely successfully, um, uh, ensuring that um, it worked as smoothly as it did a year ago with the an anniversary um, we're coming up to there. Then joined the government responsible for the uh, capital investment on infrastructure projects. Next to me, um, is Catherine Kerr, who's a fast streamer, has been in Civil Service for three years, now at DWP, um, and um, she will be giving the, the view, I hope, and the opinions of reflecting a lot of people in this audience, but obviously very much her personal opinion. On my far left um, is Bob Kerslake, uh, the head of the Civil Service, who's known to um, all of you, he's just been speaking, of course he's also Permanent Secretary at DCLG. On my immediate left, Francis Maud, the Minister um, um, in the Cabinet Office responsible for the Civil Service, who's been driving reform now for three and a quarter years. So that's the panel, and what we want to do is cover in just under an hour, a wide range of topics and, and issues. Now, what I want to do is, um, in the question time um, fashion, we have got um, some people in the audience, and there are mics there, so um, don't ask your question until the mic occurs, to um, ask their questions, and then I will follow up, um, and also the person asking the questions will have the chance to follow up as we go around the panel. And then I imagine there'll be a number of following up issues from the main kind of six we've got down here. So is Andrew Earle here from UKTI? Well, get yourself a mic um, and then I'll ask the question, please. Uh, uh, wait, wait, wait for the mic if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, thanks. Hold on, he's up there. Hello, as I said, I'm Andrew Earl from uh, UKTI. Um, I wonder, now we've got the uh, more flatter, leaner civil service, um, and everything is... Um, uh, 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 how do, how do you see us getting better in the next five years, basically? I mean, how would you define success in the new civil service in the next few years? I think I'm, I'm going to split up the two gentlemen to my left, um, especially as we have a, uh, um, a report on the civil service re reform plan appearing later this month. Uh, <laughs> I'd love all to waiting. read the report. <laughs> so I, I will, I, I'll, I'll start with you, Bob, if I might. Okay. Well, I touched on this. I've got a chance to kind of reprise my answer from the last session. Um, I think five years on, we will be a smaller civil service. We know this, and it will continue. But I genuinely believe if we deliver reform well, we will be a stronger civil service. First point is that we will have the confidence of the government of the day that we can deliver on their priorities. And in order to do that, we will have to have the right capabilities and skills uh, to deliver on their behalf. So the first point is we will have the capability, the capacity... Uh, deliver on behalf of government, we will have determinedly tackled the areas where we are currently weak. We know we're weak. Second point is we will be much more of one civil service. The civil service is a federation and in a world where resources are plentiful and you don't need to think about how much things cost, that's fine. In a world where we aren't, we have to cut out the duplication, we have to have greater coherence, we have to have stronger functional leadership, we have to look and feel like uh, one civil service to the world out there. 
Thirdly, we will be absolutely comfortable with being an open civil service where we're accountable for what we do and how we do it. Um, that hasn't been the history in the, in the sense ministers and have taken all the flat Francis, haven't they? And in a sense, civil servants should be open and challengeable about what they do. Uh, we're not, you know, the publicity and all the profile goes to ministers, but we have to be accountable for whether we deliver or well or badly, really. And I think um, if we've done things, and I'll just finish with uh, this last one, really. I think if we've done things right, we will have demonstrated how the civil service has contributed to uh, improving public services, uh, to tackling the deficit, and to driving growth, which is the single biggest priority of government at the moment, and I think for the future. Paul? Um, I mean, it's, in some respects, it's a bit hard for me to answer because I'm not really that sure from the inside what it looked like before. But what, we, you know, since I've been in government, what I've tried to do is sort of try and um, look at it through a prism of the past experiences I've got and to figure out where some of those are applicable uh, to, uh, to what the civil service does. Uh, I mean, one thing that, you know, strikes me as, and, and Bob touched on it, is, you know, it's a, it's a very like a lot of big organizations it's highly siloed and and you see i mean any big organization the key to success is being able to operate as a joined up organization being able to you know what i would describe as mine the synergies uh between uh between the departments between the organizational silos to really figure out how to get you know joined up operations going uh i think the second thing and this is again true of any i mean it's you know it's the biggest you know, one of the biggest organizations we've got. So, it, you know, the things that it will need to do better are things which are typically problems with big organizations. The second one is, you know, the issues to me are generally all with leadership, that the, um, the improvements will come from crisper, clearer, better leadership, which really is able to establish and transfer and transfer to the broader organization what it is we're really trying to do, right? What, I mean, what's the... Because I, I, if again, and this is by no means um, unique to the civil service, but you do find people um, wallowing in process rather than figuring out well, why am I really here and what will make a difference and what outcome is it I'm trying to improve and to get the organisation, you know, and all the sort of organisms within the organisation pointing in the direction to bring about that outcome you know if i did one thing when we were at the olympic games everybody knew and it's much easier right because we had a clear deadline the queen was parachuting into the you know the uh, main stadium at you know 20 to 9 on the 27th of july 2012 we knew we had to be ready but everybody knew where they fitted in and what good looked like so i i think part of the answer is in your question that people need to be asking the question that you laid out well, what am i here for what am i trying to do what are my priorities and how does that translate into what i do and how it fits in to how the bit of the organization i'm in takes things forward Catherine, how does, do you see that from your position in dwp is that clarity there yeah i i suppose i see that in two different ways um, I work in HR at the moment, so I see a lot of join up across all sorts of government, different government departments, whether it be learning, resourcing, organizational development, and, and resources are shared across different departments and services are provided and, and asked for across departments. The other thing I see is um, a couple of times a number of fast streamers from different departments have gotten together to address a problem that a couple of different departments have, sharing our viewpoints and what we can bring to it and coming up with a solution that works for different departments. And I think we'll do a lot more of that, or I hope we will, certainly. Francis, okay, what's the measure of success? Well, uh, doing things better um, for less money is the measure of success. Um, um, sorry, that's very simplistic. Um, we should elaborate a little bit. I mean, just pick up a couple of the points. I mean, the Bob, Bob, uh, well, your question, you talked about the civil service being flatter. I'm not sure we are yet flatter, actually. Um, and when we talk about being less hierarchical, uh, that sounds like that's all about um, organization and structure. It isn't. It's mostly about behavior. Um, and actually, uh, what that's about is, is what Paul was talking about, which is everyone knowing what's expected of them. What are the, what are the outputs and outcomes they're, they're expected to deliver? And once you do that, then you, what you do is create space within which people 
have the freedom and are encouraged and supported to innovate and find better ways of doing things. And, and we're not good at that. Some parts of the civil service are very good at it, but not nearly enough. Uh, and that you then get an organization that feels flatter, feels more, people feel more empowered, have more sense of personal responsibility for what they are expected to deliver. Um, and you know, part of that is a civil service that's genuinely more open, to use the, the word that Bob used. Um, and you know, we need to be really clear about what that is. It means being very truthful about ourselves, about what, you know, what we present, and publishing the Major Projects Authority report the other day, as we did. Kind of quite a painful thing to do. You know, well, <laughs> well, not all my colleagues were enthusiastically um, keen on that. Uh, on this, out of the comfort zone, both for ministers and for senior uh, officials, but it's being open. But we also need to be kind of open internally um, so that people, there's much less siloed and more open externally, so more people coming in and out of, uh, of, of government, which, again, we've got, it's been talked about ever since I've started in government a long time ago, but we've never really made a sustained success of it. Right. Andrew, anything you want to come back on now? Um, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. sorry. Um, uh, the, um, I was, I was, the reason I said about five years was because um, I was thinking would there be, if there's a, a new administration after the next general election, would they possibly... Uh, uh, cut out the reform plan or, or, or will we be back, put back five years on, you know, what, what would happen? You know, well, it, it, you, I mean, you, you know um, is there a like, is, is there a possibility, in other words, that all the work we've done in cutting down the civil service, uh, being more efficient, um, would all be, um, uh, negated if there was a no. different administration in five years' time, or is it all, all um, set in stone and the uh, senior civil service and Bob and his colleagues would yeah. make it continue? Thanks. Sure. 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 Should I have a crack at that? I mean, um, uh, I think all, it's not, certainly not going to be set in stone. Um, n no organisation, if, if an organisation gets set in stone, it's, it's deteriorating. Um, and you know, we need to be an organization that's constantly improving. All organizations are either getting better or they're getting worse. No such thing as an organization that stays the same. Um, and, um, and, and might it default back? Yeah, absolutely. Lots of organizations do. Uh, would that have anything to do with a change of government? I don't think so, actually, because whoever forms the government after the next election, they're going to face um, the same fiscal <coughs> position. It's not suddenly going to change. Um, and all the conversations I've had with um, uh, my opposite numbers in, in the Labour Party suggests that the, the view of what needs to happen with the civil service is absolutely shared because we've got this really unusual situation at the moment where all three major parties have either current or recent experience of government. And that's a kind of unusual degree of um, sort of synchronicity. Um, across them, so I, I think there's, uh, I think they, there'd be a very, very high degree of continuity. Oh, you come in there? Only two points to make, really. I absolutely share Rance's view that I think the drivers are going to be the same in many ways for any government to how to improve public service, uh, how to deliver uh, efficiencies and and, and uh, balance the budget. Um, and how to drive growth. I can't see those things changing as core tasks. And of course, a new government would have different perspectives, different priorities they're bound to have. But I think the underlying desire for the civil service to reform and improve will still be there. If I can, the second point I'd make is a personal example, if you like. I was chief executive of Sheffield City Council for over 10 years, actually. And in that time, it went from Labour to Lib Dem to hung, um, I've missed one out, but I think it went to Labour again in that period. We managed to sustain a programme of improvement um, through that of the council and how it operated through those different political changes because each of the uh, groups that ended up in control 
realised that it was in their interest to see a better run council, basically. Um, and so I think it is possible to sustain this change programme, whatever happens in uh, future elections. Yeah, and if I could say, one of the things we're doing at the Institute for Government is in the work we're doing with all the parties before the election, um, it's actually saying the, the pressures, the dilemmas are going to be exactly the same whoever's in government. And one of the problems is, whilst, whilst Francis is right, the Labour was in government three and, three and a bit years ago. An awful lot's changed since then. And there's been a big turnover of people in, uh, within the Labour Party. So one of the tasks we see ourselves at the IFG is providing a forum for sense, educating and explaining um, the, some of the challenges, because they're not always evident if you're not within government itself, what those challenges are. Um, Paul, did you see the challenges differently when you came into government in that way? Um, I, I, I mean, not, not, not really. I mean, I, I think, look, every organisation is in a constant process of trying to reform itself to change to get better. It, it's what drives every single organisation. I think the differences here are it's, it's, it, goes, it goes back to the heart of the question. Mm. You, know, you, you need to be focused on what the measures are so you can work out what you're trying mm. to do. And I think that's where the leadership comes in to be clear about, look, in two years' time, we need to look just like this. You know, I'm going to give you a picture of the end state. Here's where we are today, and here are the steps we need to take to get there. Here are the people we need, and here's the money to do it. So, I mean, that's, and it, you know, it works easier when you're in a commercial organization where the market is providing you with many of those signals. Here, you know, you, much of it you need to do yourself, which makes it a harder job, I think. Yeah, Catherine, you're in a slightly unusual position because you, you've only experienced um, well, uh, basically one party in, in control. Does that mean it's a different attitude by you and your contemporaries? Um, because you, you know, you're, you're, you're used to that environment um, rather than some people further up. I think this is a bit of a generalisation, but being a fast dreamer, mm. you're sort of meant to be young and enthusiastic yeah. and up for change and ready to get going. Um, and I think that um, where it makes most sense for my, well, in the team I'm in is when it, it is, like you say, it's really clear what the change is for and why we're moving to that. And, and when we get there, it'll be better. And I mm. think if that's clear, it makes it much easier for, for all of us, not just fast dreamers, to sort of move to that. Right, well, we've had a kind of second reading debate on the broad outlines of from There's some specific questions coming up. And I'll, I'll to speed it up, I'll, 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 I'll read them out. From Tim Howard in HMRC, digital is seen as the future, but can government ad adapt quickly enough so it's not lagging behind and therefore investing in data technology? That's obviously one for you, Francis. Well, it can. I mean, it needs to. Uh, and the great thing is, I mean, government la has lagged a long way behind. in digitization, um, which uh, is, is actually a fantastic opportunity because there's masses of upside. Um, and we've hit a moment where um, the possibilities for um, uh, digitalization mean that it can be done much cheaper, much quicker. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic moment. Um, I think the GDS, the, the, the credibility that the government digital service has gained and the collaboration with uh, departments around uh, Whitehall uh, and in some arms length bodies has been fantastic. And I mean, I think what, where, we are, where we're lagging behind is that our processes are not catching up with the way of doing things. You know, we're still in a world where you know, we have to have business cases and all this elaborate process about kind of trying to assure a program before we start. Actually, um, the way in which digital um, programs happen now is very quick, very iterative, very a genuinely agile. We often sort of say things are agile, but actually they're not agile in the way that would be understood uh, in Tech City or, or Silicon Valley. Um, and the whole kind of um, develop, test, prove, build on it if it works, stop doing it if it hasn't, do the next thing very, very rapidly um, is... Um, a, a very different way of doing things. And as long as we kind of make sure we adapt ourselves to what's today possible, um, then I think we can, we can do a massive, massive catch up uh, very quickly. And I think we're beginning to. Paul, coming from outside, how, how, what's your perspective on this? Well, I mean, this is a specific example of managing change, isn't yeah. it? And probably an, an extreme form of change. And I mean, the reality is change always, I mean, it always feels like you're driving a, you know, a very old, you know, 30-year-old motor car 
down the motorway at 70 miles an hour and still try and try to change the engine as you go. And it's never any easier than that. And, and, uh, and, you, you ha and, and that's always an excuse. There are, there are always too many reasons not to do it. I mean, I, I, you know, what my experience a, a little bit has been, and that you see a little bit more uh, here than you'd see in a world where you're up against the market, is the reasons for not doing it, because it's destabilizing, or because we can't do two things at a time, or because th those are not acceptable excuses when you're confronted by a big, bad competitor who's, you know, eating your market share. But of course here, where there isn't that constraint, uh, it's, it's given too much weight. And so uh, the arguments against change, for my, you know, in my experience, are overweighted uh, and, and leadership is generally too conservative because, you know, again, the picture of what better looks like isn't clearly enough painted and the resources to get to better aren't necessarily supplied in the way so we can share the risk of going for the, 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 the change that's necessary. Catherine, you're, I mean, I'm, I'm not asking you to speak for DWP, uh, hang on, uh, but after all, your department is involved in one of the most massive digital experiments and, and proved with, with, with digital with universal credit. Does that, are, are, are people aware of the, ch the extent of the challenge um, on that? I think some are and some aren't, depending on how, how mm. close you are, mm. but I think a helpful perspective is to think, you know, when when one goes home and takes off one civil servant hat and gets out the iPhone or the tablet or whatever, yeah. that kind of end user experience where you want to be able to, to do something at midnight or, you know, you want to be able to access a range of services and compare, that's the kind of experience I think that, that we want as users yeah. and so we will want to deliver as civil servants as well. Um, one thing DWP is trialling that's quite good is a social media um, a tool called Yammer, so it's a little bit like Facebook, but within DWP, so you can say, I'm working on this policy, does anyone have any ideas about it? And you can kind of share and collaborate, and that's quite useful. Yeah, Bob? Yeah. I'll make two points, Ruby. We can see if uh, digital is a kind of rather cuddly thing, but actually it's a disruptive technology. Um, uh, and I'll just kind of illustrate the point. Uh, there's a, a museum in Sheffield called the Hawley Collection, and it's a collection of tools. You might say incredibly boring, a collection of tools. How could that be interesting? But what you go in there and you see is whole kind of rows of tools used for a particular technology that overnight became obsolete. Overnight. Entire industries changed overnight. Incredible. Um, and that actually is the nature of what digital does. It literally changes the way things work and operate. Um, and that, therefore, as Paul said, can lead, if you're a, a naturally defensive organisation, can lead to quite a lot of resistance to change because it challenges the status quo, it challenges the current uh, power structure, if you like. So one of the big things we have to do with digital is to be very focused on the end game, what's it going to achieve for the public, and be pretty determined to drive it through, because otherwise it, it doesn't happen. Second point I'd make, and I've seen a couple of really good examples of digital projects is that actually you, you need the technical capability but you actually need people who aren't technically capable working in a team. The most powerful projects that we're doing on digital um, combine policy people with comms people with technical people um, and if you do that you can move very rapidly. If you're absolutely clear on what the end game is it's incredible how fast some of these new applications, new approaches are being created you know, in much less than a year, um, much faster than other ways of doing this. Thanks. Is Tim Howard here? Um, right. Is, is anyone want, particularly want to come back on this one um, to, to, give, to give a point? We got the mics around. Yeah, there's a lady down here. Um, if you could wait for the mic to come to you. Um, And could you say who you are and where you're from, please? Uh, my name is Joan Ogbebo from the Home Office. Um, we've talked about, uh, you've talked about um, driving growth as a biggie. And given that the, home of, um, the civil service is not really very well known for its commercial capability, how would you increase or enhance this? 
Right, that's one for you, Paul, I think. Well, and, you know, France is working on this too. I mean, from, from my um, perspective, I'm looking particularly at the big infrastructure projects and really the decision that we're making. And, and historically, we've, we've been you know, heading in this direction for some time is, you, you know, you create specialised units which are set up and managed like a commercial business where you can both hire in people who've got those skills at, you know, generally at the senior level and you can train junior people, you know, accordingly where the incentives, you know, the pay structures are appropriate for that, you know, where you put people in a job for a period which actually match, matches the, you know, the maturity of the project. You can't, you know, if you're working on a seven year project, having somebody rotate off every two years is hopeless because all they care about is that they didn't screw up in year two. They don't really care about what the outcome is in year seven and it produces very, very different behavior. So, so for me, part, part of the answer is, you know, um, centralizing our commercial expertise in specialized units which are really focused on delivery and the whole heartbeat of that, you know, the heartbeat and drumbeat of that unit is, is delivery and commerciality. So that you're, you're matching the outside world with people who are as, you know, ugly and mean about getting good value as they are. Taking that, t taking that point on, I mean, is, I an mean, interesting thing in the recent IPPR report, um, was a suggestion that um, SROs running projects, not only should they remain in place for longer, but they should have a separate accountability. So I did to highlight that in running projects. W what are your views on that, Francis? Well, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting idea. I mean, uh, it will um, continue to be the case that the principal accountability of government is mm -hmm. through ministers mm -hmm. to parliament. Um, that's not always comfortable, but, um, but it, and it feels extremely accountable. Um, and that's not going to change. You've got the specific accountability of accounting officers yeah. to the PAC, and that won't uh, change either. But I mean, what's proposed is that an, a, an SRO of a project should uh, be able to be accountable to a select committee, the relevant select committee. And I think actually this can strengthen the hand of the SRO, because actually what enables the SRO to do is to say, actually, if I'm gonna be held accountable, I'm gonna make damn sure that I'm set up right that I've actually, that the, the project's been properly thought through, uh, and there's been a lot of criticism. Lord Brown, I mean, Paul's done some great work on this. Lord Brown's done as well. And one of the conclusions is we, we tend to drift into projects, um, and we don't have the kind of rigorous um, initiation process where you really work out what are we go trying to achieve, what's needed, what are the milestones, all of this, and do that. And so if you're an SRA, you're going to be held accountable. You're going to ins absolutely insist that that's a much more rigorous process than it currently or has tended in the past to be. I think we're getting better at it. We've still got a way to go. But what about Paul's point, which came out, I mean, we just studied the IFG on, on the lessons of the Olympics, and an absolutely clear point there was, as Paul said earlier, obviously it was a clear timetable when the Queen had to parachute out, although we didn't know that was the exact what was going to be the, the, the highlight. But we did know when it had to start, but the, his team were there and there for a very long time. Yeah. Um, is it possible, particularly in the area of cutbacks, uh, you know, very large cutbacks in, 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 in staff numbers, actually to have people in place for longer yeah. for running projects? And, and, and I'll, I'll bring Bob in. You know, yeah, but I mean, it, it, it absolutely is, and it's essential. But actually, when before the, before the downsizing, uh, we have far too much to, Paul's absolutely right, and we've recognized this in the plan last year. We said that far too much turnover of, um, of, of SROs. Um, I mean, there was one project where, uh, I can't remember which one it was, but where they basically, the new SRO every six months. I mean, no kind of continuity at, at all, and, and we have to do this, and we haven't done it yet. We haven't, we haven't delivered on this. Um, uh, and, and we absolutely need to, that continuity is crucial. And we need to be willing, I mean, what we've put in place actually is a, a pay mechanism that enables us to, you know, when someone said, actually, I want to go off and get promoted and move to another job, actually, for, for Bob and his colleagues to be able to say, no, sorry, you've got to stay in this job, but we will give you, we've given ourselves the flexibility to give you more pay to reward you to stay there and see it through in exceptional circumstances. Bob? Well, 100% right. I think... Um the thing that Francis is alluding to is what we've called the pivotal role allowance, and it is exactly to pick up people who are in key roles, who we need to stay there, who therefore must be able to advance in terms of their pay and position during the project. It's full stop. I mean, that's just got to happen. 
and the pivotal role allowance is one step along the road to get there. I also agree uh, with, with Paul's work on having a dedicated resource to deliver big projects so you're clear about the accountabilities. I think on commercial, the truth is we, we cannot grow it enough internally quick enough, basically. We have to buy in some more commercial capability. I'm quite clear on that. But I don't want it only to be about buying in people. At the same time, we must develop a, a wider commercial awareness across the whole of the civil service, and we must develop expertise. We must grow it in-house as well. But for now, the demands that we have are too great for us to do it all internally, and we will have to buy some in if we're going to succeed on some of these big, that actually complex projects. That ties in with the, with the next question, um, which is, what have you identified as key skills gaps that will need to, uh, to be sourced externally? It comes from actually a, 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 a colleague, Catherine, in, in DWP, Raymond Dempsey. So which, which are the skills gaps which you, you'll need to do externally? Have, have, where have you identified those parts? Well, I think the capabilities plan um, talks about this, and we've said, in effect, in the capabilities plan, we need a strategy that's both about making, uh, buying and borrowing, basically. And I think the, f the three kind of core areas where we're going to have to bring in expertise um, for particular things are commercial, we've talked about that. Mm. Project management, we've still not got enough people who can do big and complex projects. And we talked about it earlier, digital. I would pick out those three as being critical ones. One might argue that we, in some cases, need more kind of corporate finance, but actually for the shareholder executive, I think we've got some good skills there now to draw mm. on. So I think the three key areas are going to be commercial, program project management, and digital. Um, and there's, we, we will need to buy in more, but we should grow at the same time. It isn't either or, we've got to do both. No, I mean, Catherine, you're uh, doing HR. Do you, do you feel a need, you, you would like to spend your, some of your career specialising, spending a long time on a project, or is the kind of ambition of fast stream always to be moving on? I think um, very helpfully with the competency framework, sort of fast stream, as I told you, need to get sort of these sorts of experience, and that spans from project to mm. specialisms. I think being in HR, it is really helpful to have operational roles as well as roles and get that range of experience and and being a junior person on a change project as I am now I, I appreciate sort of stability not only because I am challenged and asked to deliver and have to stay there and improve myself but also it's really useful to learn from people who don't move every six months so you can really understand a bit more and grow into to knowing the skills yourself. Paul, all right we all know the Olympics was a special project how much can the model of that, and this links both skills and broad project management, be applied to some, some of the ones announced last Thursday, the review of the, of the major project? How much can you ad adapt that model to ensure you do get good results? Oh, I, I think you know, much of it can be, uh, uh, can be applied. Um, I mean, the very fact that you've got a special purpose entity with a chief executive whose job is to deliver that project, mm. and you know, that's what he's there for. He'll hire a team that he or she will hire a team that you know, are there to do that job with the right skills. It's, it gives you a chance to you know, reinvent you know, the, the bit of the organization you need to deliver the project. You can get, you know, you can, you know, you, you, we should be able to organize ourselves so we can pay the right levels of compensation, put the right kind of incentives in place. Um, and you will ask yourself all the right, you know, when you set up the new organization, you'll ask, you'll re-ask yourself all the right questions about the project. You know, what does success look like? You know, what, what are objectives? What's the timetable? Is the budget right? Because you know, when you set up an organization, it forces itself to readdress all those. We're, you know, we're sometimes guilty here of sort of rolling a, a, a little bit from a sort of a policy announcement into a, uh, you know, sort of a general idea, then to, into kind of starting the project. And before you know it, you're sort of half bait with something that never really got looked at by someone who'd have to deliver the end product, and that's a horrible place to be suspended. Yeah. Well, I think that, that's exactly right. I mean, that was the, the phenomenon um, I was referring to earlier, was kind of sometimes drifting into, without a kind of hard, fast point where this is, this is what we're, we're doing. Um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, just pick up Bob's point about um, commercial skills. Um, Actually, I mean, I completely agree with Bob that we, we will have to bring in some from outside. I have already done so. Uh, but actually, what we found in the Efficiency Reform Group and Cabinet Office, where we do a lot of commercial stuff, 
um, there's some fantastic career civil servants who've, who've picked this up and who love it, who are really, really good at it. Um, and I think we, it, we sometimes underestimate how quickly people, um, mainstream career civil servants, how much they want to pick up new skills and are good at doing it. I mean, just a, 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 one of the things that's changed since I was last around in government, which was 20, more than 20 years ago now, is, is that the professional streams are much stronger than they were. Um, and anyway, when I was last around in the, in the 80s and very early 90s, uh, it was still the case too often that the um, finance director, they weren't even called that, they were called the principal finance officer. Or something. And these will, would very often have been eight people running HR and IT and, and so on, would very often be kind of generalist civil servants. And you're told, you know, for career development purposes, you've got to spend two years doing fi being the finance director for a big department. Well, that's no way to run things. This is much better than it was. Um, it's not strong enough yet, um, and, and the functional leadership, uh, as we put out, set out in the plan, we'll have more to say about that, needs to, needs to be stronger and more visible and create more kind of u u unification, as it were, across the, across the civil service. But it, it's already much better than, uh, than it w used to be. But let's, let's move on to uh, uh, it's a question actually from, from a member of your department, Bob. Um, Rachel Crook, I don't know if she's here. Um, um, she's here? Um, anyway, she, her question is, why are the public absent from all policy discussions? Um, I'll, I'll start off with you on that, Bob. Well, it's a poor piece of policy making if the public aren't engaged in the process. That's the whole bit of thinking on open policy making that we don't start with an assumption that Whitehall knows best, that we build in, if you like, the, the jargon phrase is co-production, uh, the public and others into the process of developing uh, policy. And um, that's what open policy making should be about. And it should be the default in how we develop policy. And I think there are some really good examples of that happening. And there's some really good examples now on the kind of open policy website that Chris, Wor Chris Wormald and his team have developed. So for me, that it is absolutely the case that they should be very present and very visible in our thinking from the off, actually. And that's the assumption we should make in developing policy alongside others, that is the key stakeholders and so on. They should all be part of the, the picture. Um, and we move away, if we don't decisively move away from the default of uh, uh, doing it openly, then I think we've got problems. And the reason why I say that, just one last point, is that the tools available to us to deliver policy goals are different now. Um, for most of my time in local government, the way central government did things was to either uh, give us money to do it, or set us targets, lots of detailed targets, or alternately um, compel us to do it through legislation. Um, and regulation. And all of those three tools now are, see, are not they're immediately available to us. So we have to look at other ways of delivering change. And you can only do it if you absolutely understand what will drive and motivate people to do what you want to do. So the public have to be centre stage in our thinking on policy making. We've done a, in, we were involved in an interesting project at present at the AFG with the big lottery fund, which funds lots of small community projects. Mm -hmm. And um, the, what, they, what we're doing is linking up um, civil servants who are policy makers with the people actually running the projects on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my colleagues was down in Plymouth um, uh, last Thursday um, with a community-based project. And that sense of um, so that exposing lots of people here to actually what it means on the ground. And we found actually the greatest enthusiasm has come from civil servants on this. We've had no problem at all getting people to go out for a day, do things. It's actually more of a problem sometimes with the community and voluntary groups because they don't have the resources themselves no, to handle it. But it actually, as, 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 a, as a project from our point of view, it's been really interesting because a lot of all level civil servants have been really interested in, 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 in that um, and, and that aspect. Now, Elizabeth, I miscalled you earlier on. I, I, I apologise. Elizabeth, what, do you, do you, how do you connect up with the public? You mentioned earlier, quite interestingly, the, you know, you go home, you use social media, you, you connect that way. Um, what about when you're, when you're in DWP? 
what senses are, is the public out there? Mitchell, you, all right, you're doing an HR job now, which is more of an internal job. What sense is there that the public is out there? So DWP is going through quite a lot of corporate changes from universal credit to all sorts of things. Um, and one source of going out to the public that we use a lot is insight derived from different groups, think tanks. Institute for Government, but also a lot of different charities um, and third sector bodies that do a lot of research. We do draw quite heavily on those in making policy because we possibly don't have the time or the, the, the um, ability to go out and canvas broadly in trying to think about what will be effective. So we do draw quite a lot on those sources. Paul, uh, oh, I mean, big projects. They're really big, the ones you deal with. Where does the public come in? Well, in most cases, I mean, the public uh, are the ultimate, uh, you know, users or consumers of them. So they're, I mean, they're absolutely central to it. And, you know, the whole thrust that I've been trying to push, I mean, it was true of the games, it's true in infrastructure, is, you know, you have to think about the outcomes you're trying to create. So, you know, I, we don't want to necessarily, you know, build a road. We want to find a way to make sure someone, you know, we can get from A to B faster, which may, you know, so we may manage the motorway by using the hard shoulder rather than building a new one. I mean, at the Olympics, we weren't thinking about, you know, a, a sort of supplier-driven, you know, here's the Olympic Games, consume it if you want. I mean, we went client group by client group to figure out what would constitute a sensational experience for a spectator, for an athlete, for a broadcaster covering it, for somebody, a games maker, a volunteer working there. And we planned everything we did to maximize the probability of creating a great outcome. And that's, that's, to me, is how you think about engaging the public. It's what ultimately is the experience you're trying to create. How do you take the risk out of it going badly? And how can you put a bit of, you know, some icing and cherries on the cake if you've got a little bit of room to, to dazzle them with your brilliance? Like parachutists, yes. Um, oh. Francis, I mean, you, 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 in the um, plan, uh, plan a year ago, you opened the Policy Contestability Fund. You've had one, one report back from that, and it's also uh, applying now in DEFRA, isn't it? Um, that, that you're extending it there. How, how, how much can policy making actually be opened up realistically? Well, I think quite a lot. I mean, Jeremy Hayward's always said that the um, civil service um, shouldn't be regarded as having a monopoly on policy advice. And I think there are now, if I recollect rightly, I think there are about eight bids um, going through the contestable policy fund. Um, but it's not just about that. I mean, that's a, a kind of finding a source of advice from outside, and that um, um, can, can be valuable and, and stimulating. Um, but it's also kind of thinking about policy differently. I mean, what, what I don't think any government could sustain anymore is the sense that you can lock yourselves away um, come up with a lot of policy um, and to present it and say this is it. I mean, the whole way in which we do digital um, is actually about thinking about a service from the outside in. You know, what's it like for the user of the service and then design it back to, um, uh, in, to the inside. Too much in the past what uh, governments have tended to do and, and old-fashioned um, private sector companies have tended to do is work out what suits the organization and simply say, well, here's, here's the offering to, to the public, take it or leave it. Um, and you can't get away with that um, any, anymore. So I think it's thinking about it from the outside in, you know, from you know, what is the user, what is the effect on the citizen, and reflecting it back in. I think the, the uh, processes of policy making and legislation are more open and much more t uh, tendency to consult in a, in, a, in a more open way rather than kind of going through a formulaic process of consulting some vested interests and then doing what you wanted to do anyway. Um, uh, I think, uh, but I mean, pre-legislative scrutiny is much more um, fr frequent now and I think very good way of kind of flushing out concerns and accommodating them before it's difficult to, um, to, to make the changes. Um, so I think it's a, it's a different kind of mindset really. Um, and uh, and you, you can't actually go back. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point on, on irreversibility, which was raised before in terms of reform. I, 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 I think so much of what we're talking about will carry on. And I mean, the, 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 because the, the, that's the broader direction, it's where technology is, where people's attitudes are in going in that direction. Now, Elizabeth, I'm, 
the next question is really, in a sense, um, you should start off on. How can we encourage greater gender balance in the senior civil service? What processes do we need to put in place to see a more diverse senior civil service? This is from Rebecca Baldwin at DEC. I suppose she's the only woman on the panel this year. Yeah. I should start this one. Um, I think... You, you, can, you can set the terms of the debate. Although I'm not a senior civil servant, I think when, when, you, when I look at the very sort of top of the civil service compared to a couple of years ago where it was 50-50, it looks a little less encouraging. Um, just looking within my department, the sort of, I suppose, senior leadership from uh, of the S CS but not perm sec level, it's more encouraging, it's about 40%. Um, but I think the most the thing that sort of inspires me and I think other younger women who are in the civil service is thinking, okay, well, how do these women work very hard to balance work and life? How do they have a fulfilling career and um, enjoy family life as well? Uh, and, and a lot of women who are in the senior civil service I think, put a lot of time and effort into mentoring and sponsoring, and I've certainly benefited from that, um, and I hope that continues. Um, I joined the civil service relatively recently, coming from the private sector, and I think, in my experience, what the civil service offers in terms of um, flexible working and the different sort of mechanisms to make it easy for, for me to have that, how do I balance work and life, is more generous than it is often in the private sector. So I think that's something that um, maybe we can sort of take for granted as well. Yeah, take for granted. Yes, that's an interesting point. I mean, it, uh, the, the degree to which actually the civil service is, is actually way ahead of a lot of private sector employers in that respect. Bob? Yes, um, two points to make here. It's true to say that at the top, uh, perm sec level, we have moved back in the last year or so. Um, but if you take the whole of the senior civil service over a decade or so, we've actually seen real change, a significant increase in the number of uh, women in the senior civil service and that's not an accident that's through conscious policies to positively support uh, more women going into the senior civil service not positive discrimination everybody gets treated the same when they go into the interview room um, but we've taken positive action so that people can see the, their own potential if you like and be ready for the opportunities as they come along so I think we've actually made progress um, we've got to keep going at it um, and we've got to seek to get the top level back to the 50-50 that we fleetingly held for a short period uh, before Minouche went off to the, uh, to the IMF. Uh, that's my uh, personal commitment. Francis? Well, I agree with that. I mean, um, it isn't that the civil service doesn't encourage women. It does. I think, more than half, I think I'm right in saying more than half of civil servants are, are women um, today. Um, and, but I think we need to do more. And, and as Bob says, this is not about kind of um, uh, quotas or positive discrimination, but it is about, you know, we do need to understand better why um, women find it tougher to get to the top slots. Um, and um, and that, that's a piece of work we need to do. Paul? Look, I'm a great believer in the power of uh, diversity to create a better organization and you know you need it at the uh, absolutely uh, at the top and I think it's the attitude at the top which actually drives it through the organization I think you've got to think about um, diversity across it's not just gender it's um, ethnicity it's um, disability as well and to, to my mind the um, I mean the civil service should actually be the leading organization in the country for setting the standard uh, in how this is done and holding itself to that standard. So I, I wouldn't go too easy on you. You, know, you should really be absolutely the role model for the rest of the organizations in the country and how you do this. And it's a good bet to make because you, you know, we will be a much better organization for it. It's very interesting. In my organization, we've got some former civil servants who are actually, in our internal discussions, the most demanding on some of those issues because they're used to it. So when we discuss one, I mean, we, I've got an organization of 41, 42 people. When we discuss some employment issues, actually it's the former civil servants say, hold on, you know, what about this or that? And you know, of course the limits what you can do in a small organization, but not that many limits. You can still, I mean, exactly the point you're making, Elizabeth, on the right balances with people with young children. I find, you know, as you, actually, you can do it without affecting the efficiency of the organization, without affecting the esteem in which someone is doing that. So, hold on, I, I, I think it can be done perfectly well. I share, by the way, Paul's view that we should be an exemplar, really, in the civil service. It's quite right. 
Right, now uh, let's um, um, move on to a, a slightly different I I issue, which is, um, and since so looking ahead, because we, we've got, ooh, oh, we've only got seven or eight minutes left, so it's right to the last question. One um, posed by Richard uh, Dudney from Diffid. The spending review um, for 2015-16, we, we saw the results of uh, six days ago. Um, spending restraint after the next general election would like to be more severe, and then um, there's almost certain to be, well, there will be clearly a, a quite big review in two years' time. Um, what's that going to mean for service delivery, the reach of the state, and the role of civil servants? I think it's an appropriate one to, to end up on. Um, Bob? I was dreading you were going to give me that as the first question. <laughs> give me two seconds to think about it. It's a massive question. Um, I think it's right to say we are going to see continuing uh, austerity, or call it what you want, continuing drives for greater efficiency. Uh, post 2015-16, uh, and the numbers tell you that, really. Um, I think, um, in terms of public services, uh, there's still some way to go, in my view, about what I would call public service transformation, about changing the way services deliver on the ground. Um, we recently, you saw in the, um, sorry, I should say in the spending round, more funding going into the Troubled Families Initiative. We've seen uh, announcements of money going into integration between health and care. I absolutely think a key part of the agenda and key part of the answer to this question of um, how we manage and do more with less, if you like, has got to be about how we reconfigure services at local level. Um, uh, too often what we do is deal with the symptoms and not the underlying uh, causes. So I think a big part of the story of managing with less money is um, public service transformation, particularly at local level. Second thing I'd say is, whilst we have made a lot of efficiencies, there's more to do. Um, when you talk to people, I had two or three people come up to me at the end of my session saying, do you realise we're still doing these things in a way that duplicates? There's a lot more to go at. I know this is your view, Francis, as well. We haven't finished the process of driving efficiency. And I think the, the last point I'll make is that the role of the civil service remains the same in a sense to support the government of the day in delivering its priorities um, and what I think we've learnt is that we have a very positive role to play in all these key agendas whether it's promoting growth whether it's driving efficiency whether it's transforming services these are not kind of um, how can I put it just simply diminishing roles and diminishing responsibilities they remain centre stage priorities for for the civil service so there's still a big exciting and demanding agenda out there, notwithstanding the, some of the financial challenges we face. Paul? You know, when I think of, uh, you know, when, whenever I've had to manage, uh, you know, big budgets and, and figure out how to get, you know, to save some money, I mean, I mean, f firstly, it's always been caused by the fact that I haven't got enough revenue coming in, so I just have to do it. It's not like I've got a choice. And, I mean, the interesting, just a perspective if you're interested. I mean, what, what I always find interesting in the way we have to do business here is, of course, the first thing you do is to try and get a budget to do something, and then you spend it all. Um, I mean, uh, in the private sector, you're used to only being able to spend what it is you're able to generate by way of revenues, and it, it's a completely different mindset. So uh, you see extraordinarily skillful behavior going on here to get a bigger budget that allows you to do more scope than you probably need, builds in conservatism, and this, it, you know, that's a real skill set here, so it's always possible to deliver within the budget. And uh, if you actually only had half as much money to start with, you would be amazed by how effective you'd be, either in doing more for less, that's the productivity side, or quite frankly, just being much, much more decisive about your priorities, which is ultimately what it comes down to. And some things, you know, whether it's, you know, on the welfare side or whether it's on the number of, you know, services we're delivering, whatever it is, you know, if you didn't have the resources, you'd find that, well, we really actually just don't need to do that. And, uh, and it's all about the discipline and getting that right to me. And it's very easy to say. Uh, but, you know, we have the luxury of being able to create budgets for ourselves, which, the, you know, in the private sector you don't have. And it, I think it does hold back on our, the rigour of our prioritisation and the, uh, the urge and the, and the real drive for productivity. 
Elizabeth, how do you see the role of civil servants? You're at the beginning of your career. Um, you will serve lots of governments um, under various colours, combinations, who knows. Um, how do you see, given the, the pressures which Bob's described and Paul's described, how do you see your role? Are you apprehensive? You know, is it going to be quite what you joined? Um, um, will you feel, do you feel, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not too sure about this, let's see how it works out. I think my experience is quite coloured by my first placement, which was in the National Offender Management Service, which governs prisons and hmm. runs prisons and probations. Um, and being based in a prison and working quite close to the front line and having watching this debate play out really coloured it. So the money is less, the number of prisoners is the same, who are we delivering to courts, prisoners, victims, fam victims, victims' families, how are we going to do what we do? Mm -hmm. um, a really strong service ethos um, and having to be really creative about delivering similar agendas in a really mm -hmm. creative way because the, the demand is still there. Um, and so I think that's really shaped how I see my role as a civil servant. It is there to serve the public. Um, things are hard. Um, it's really difficult watching some of these debates play out. Um, but it's inspiring as well because you get to see actually the benefit and the good of what we do. I'm dealing with a client group who'd rather not be uh, uh, w exactly. with you, <laughs> which is always the complication with that. So that's really interesting. Now, Francis, what about looking at what Whitehall looks like? Um, we're very used, for us, nearly a century now, from Haldane, to a particular structure of departments um, where they're fierce independence. Um, it's not just a matter of numbers of departments, because anyone can redesign the number of departments. Mm -hmm. uh, I see the local government association would doing so today. They want an e English department, which um, I see Bob chuckling over a debate he's, uh, he, uh, he, he, he's uh, seen many, many times. But also the, the, the very way departments operated. I mean, there's a different model. Scotland has a different model. Yep. Finland do, Austria do. How attracted are you by we're really quite fundamental change? Look, I think there's, um, uh, there's a whole lot of issues there. I mean, um, if we do what we set out um, in, in the plan and create something which is much more unified with kind of shared services so the silos get more broken down, then actually where you draw departmental lines becomes less of an issue, actually. If you have, for example, technology, so that actually you can move from one department to another, take your own email, technology is the same, the, uh, common platforms, then it all becomes a hell of a lot easier. Um, I mean, some of the issues in, 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 in the question um, are, uh, I mean, I just, sorry, start, start, starting back a bit. Um, sometimes when we talk about civil service reform, people say, well, let's be really clear about what the civil service is going to do. You know, what's going to be the size of the state, for example. Well, you can't decide that, actually, because there will be different governments at different times with different parties who will have a different view about that. Um, you know, parties, uh, governments of the centre-left will tend to end up with a state that does more uh, than a government of the centre-right. That's just in the nature of things. Um, there will be, um, uh, to the extent to which a government uh, weights equity over uh, local accountability, there'll be a different balance between centralisation and, and, and localism. You know, these are political, policy, directional uh, decisions. W where I think the, the, constant the constant pressure in terms of what the civil service is for is that it is there to serve the public in delivering what the government of the day has decided. Um, and that is, and, and doing it better all the time, because the one thing that I think is absolutely clear is that frankly, even if we uh, suddenly austerity, the need for austerity disappeared, which it's not going to do uh, any time soon, um, we still should be an organization which is seeking efficiency savings every year. The best, most efficient organizations everywhere expect to deliver more by way of efficiency savings year on year on year. You never stay still. And, you know, we, we haven't been used to that. Um, and we're getting used to it. And actually, one of the things that I think has been really interesting in this latest spending round is how departments which uh, two or three years ago were really resistant to saying, oh, we can't make any more efficiency savings, are willing to accept that there are efficiency savings to be had, and big ones, and actually coming to say, help us do it. Uh, to, uh, and so I think there's much more scope, much more acceptance of, of what 
can be done and a much greater um, willingness to embrace it and drive it. And actually, as, as um, Elizabeth was saying, actually, that you know, necessity being the mother of invention, that when you are the person who's doing the inventing, doing the innovating, being creative, actually, the satisfaction you get in doing your job is very exciting. It, it becomes more fulfilling, whereas doing same old, same old is not the great sort of pulse racer but actually doing the different thing and seeing how you make it work better and seeing how you're doing something really different that means that that prisoner, when he or she leaves, it's normally a he, leaves, doesn't immediately get on the carousel and come back into prison. That's a fantastically rewarding thing. And we need to be doing this better all the time. And when we do, don't we feel great about it? Bob, final word. I just want to finish with one... My inspirational example on this, actually, um, which comes from TV. Uh, you'll have all seen recently that we honoured uh, Rowan Atkinson and Tony Robinson for Blackadder and Baldrick. Um, actually, the first series of Blackadder was not at all successful. Um, it was a pretty... Uh, it flopped almost, in fact, as a first series. And the producer of the programme, in fact, cut the budget. Uh, what he did was he reduced the amount of outside filming and he brought the programme indoors to make it a much tighter scripted comedy programme working closely within a studio. And that was really the key thing that shifted it from being a so-so programme that probably would have ended after two series to being the triumphant success it was, that and brilliant acting and script writing. But it's a good example of how actually a better programme was produced because uh, they tightened up the budget and forced them to focus on the essentials of what that made that program great, really. So that's my small but inspirational example of how you can do better. Well, th less. that, I might say, is the, the least predictable answer to any question <laughs> we've had this afternoon. I think you definitely win the Populist Award, Bob. Well, uh, I don't know. Um, I wasn't uh, planning that. to do that. Uh, we've now got to wrap up, because um, we've exceeded our time. We, 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 we'd have moved on to another program if it had been the live television program. It's been absolutely fascinating, uh, with very different perspectives. Uh, so could I thank Paul Dighton, Elizabeth Kerr, um, uh, Francis Ward, Bob Kerslake, very much indeed. I would point out earlier, I, I, I gathered from Jane Dudman of, of Guardian Public Leaders, um, that when Catherine Granger appeared on this stage, um, she was mobbed for autographs I, uh, I, from her tweet. But when um, your, your um, co-leader, Jeremy Hayward, did, no one was mobbing Jeremy, which I think probably is right for the Cabinet Secretary. It's different for the head of the Civil Service, most of the Cabinet Office, a fast streamer, and the, the, the boss of infrastructure. So any mobbing welcome now but thank you all very much and could you on your behalf thank you